All right, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Rhiannon Anderson. I'm going to be pretty quick so that we can get to our speakers. I am the executive director of the Congressional App Challenge, which is a congressional initiative to address the shortage of adequately trained technical talent in this country through app challenges that are hosted by the members of Congress for the students in their districts. Um, in the last year and a half, I'm really proud to say that we have reached nearly 4,000 kids. And in 2016, we had over, or we had 123 members of Congress participate from 33 states. Uh, from all those districts, we had uh, 650 apps that were submitted, original apps that kids created and submitted as part of their member of Congress's Congressional App Challenge, and that the congressional participation was incredibly bipartisan, with 59 Republicans participating and 64 Democrats. I also want to say thank you to Congressman Goodlatte, who I'm not sure if he's already left, but he was one of our inaugural co-chairs, and this project wouldn't have gotten off the ground without his support. Uh, so one of those members of Congress who participated in this last year, and actually every year, was uh, Congresswoman Susan Del Benny, and I was very excited to get to go to her district, the first district of Washington, which she will tell you is the most beautiful district in America. Yes, absolutely. And she's allowed to say that since she represents that district. <laughs> Um, she hosted a hackathon for the students in her district. It was well attended and uh, got to actually see the kids in action creating their apps. She will be speaking with Julie Samuels, who is IAF's board member and is also the president of the board of Engine. And she is also the executive director of Tech NYC, an organization in New York City, as you might have guessed from the name, working on promoting entrepreneurship and startups. And with that, I will let them get to it. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for being here. Um, let's, let's start with the Congressional App Challenge and what that was like in your district. And I believe the winner was called uh, Code Carbon. Carbon. Uh -huh. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that day and what you saw. So, um, you know, we had done, this was the second time we did the App Challenge, and I think now that there was more word of mouth out there and some of the schools knew that we were doing that, we had more students participate. We had, the hack, we had a hackathon, which was really a Saturday and Sunday event and we had industry experts come in to help give coaching to the students, and we weren't sure what to expect, if anyone was gonna show up and if they were gonna stay. We had dinner, you know, lunch and dinner um, all there, and the students came and they stayed till we told them they had to leave um, that night, and were there um, first thing in the morning the next day. Um, so very engaged, very excited, and I think the, the mentors who came were also very excited about how enthusiastic the students were. Um, the, the winning team created an interactive mobile game to help people look at kind of how, look at carbon and, and energy and understand some of the trade-offs that have to be made. And so they had gone through a lot of issues to understand, you know, how do you provide energy for your community? What does that do in terms of um, impact on the environment? And so they, it was very thoughtful, but we had a lot of great applications, great thought, great energy, and I think that bodes well for the future. I do too. Um, and, and something you've worked a lot on is STEM education, computer science education. Obviously, these two things align, the app challenge and those issues. I'm curious what you think um, about, when you think of it from a policy perspective, what we can do, what you can do in, in your role on Capitol Hill, what the rest of us can do to uh, make sure that everyone in this country has access to computer science education. Um, well, there's multiple things we need to address. One is to really accept that computer science is not just a science off to the side. It's really part of what people do as part of their everyday lives. And learning how to code, even basic coding, and understanding how technology works is critically important to whatever you're going to do. And so um, making that part of curriculum across the country is very, very important. And so we've had legislation to try to make sure that schools are offering coding. Um, there's organizations like Hour of Code that are doing a great job of helping students get engaged and and in a fun way, so that you know you don't really realize you're kind of going through coding aspects, even though you might be to you you're playing a game, but it's very important. Uh, so I think and and getting students of from all backgrounds involved is also very very important. So we've had um, many organizations who are doing great work. For example, Girls Who Code and others to get um, students engaged and involved. Great robotics work happening. 
across the country, First Robotics and others with challenges to get um, teams of, of students working together. But we have a lot of work to do to continue to make sure that things are accessible, especially in our rural communities. Um, we have a great effort that's been taking place in my district between students in Redmond who are at a STEM school, a, a school that's focused on STEM, and students up in Darrington, which is in a very rural part of my district. And, um, and they've formed a partnership where the STEM students have gone up and worked with the students, the, the, middle, the high school students um, in the STEM school have gone up to Darrington, a rural area, and started to teach them how to code and get them engaged in technology. And then the students in Darrington have worked with the high school students to show them the forest and help them learn about our lands and what's happening in our areas. And it's been a great collaboration. And not only students learning about different areas and, and um, understanding that the whole world doesn't look like their hometown, but um, making sure that collaboration is happening. And that's been a great model and something I think we can do they, don't, they aren't that far apart. They're maybe an hour and a half drive away, but very, very different in terms of the experience they've had as students. And so I think that's something we can replicate in other areas across the country. I think your district is actually one of the most interesting districts to me when we think about a lot of Besides issues. being the most beautiful. Besides district. being the most beautiful. <laughs> um, because exactly what you're talking about, you really have kind of both ends of, of, this, of the spectrum here. And you also have, as I understand, a lot of advanced manufacturing we do. So we have um, you know, a lot of aerospace in our region. Um, Microsoft's headquarters is in my district. So we have technology. We have a lot of national forests and national park, a lot of forestry. And um, when we had um, a, a terrible landslide in our district a few years ago um, that many of you heard about, um, it, you know, that was in a, a rural region near Darrington, the school I was just talking about, or the area I was just talking about. And so, but with aerospace and manufacturing, biotechnology and medical device manufacturing, it's, uh, I think it's really uh, been helpful for me as a legislator to see that diversity. So when we're here and trying to understand solutions and understanding what works in rural areas and urban areas and how technology can work in things like agriculture has been very, very important. And sometimes we don't think about the diversity when we look at policy. I think that's so true. And, and we talk a lot about computer science in schools, and that's obviously crucial. But a lot of these other things you and I are talking about right now are the really good jobs of the future, but broader than just computer science. Something. I've been thinking about uh, the future of education is how we teach entrepreneurism, how we teach risk taking, and what kind of policies support that. I don't know if that's something you'd like to comment on as well. Well, I think you know the, the idea of risk taking is something we've had a conversation of in a, in a lot of ways, and even here on the Hill. Um, if you look at the investments we made, for example, in basic research for so many years, you know, our investments that we make in basic research really are investments in new ideas, and it is you know taking a risk. We don't; these are ideas where you know if we knew the answer, it wouldn't. We wouldn't need to be doing the research. So we're trying to learn what's working and what's not working. But when you talk to researchers today, uh, they feel like we're less willing to invest in risk. We're we're more willing, if you're looking at grants, they're going to proven researchers. So younger researchers are having trouble getting access to some of those same grants for research. And um, maybe new ideas aren't being explored. People feel like there's more focus on things having to work. And yet the whole idea of, of research is taking risks, finding new ideas, and we should value the learning we get. Because sometimes it's when things don't work as we expect that we have a, the great breakthrough. And, um, and so we've got to think about that in policy policy, but we also have to make sure that we encourage that when we're looking at innovation, because there are going to be great, great ideas that come probably from things that didn't work as expected. Right, right. I totally agree. Um, while we're kind of on the topic of entrepreneurism and innovation, I think there's one issue that is near and dear to both of our hearts, and that's increased presence of women. Um, and I know you've been really involved. You um, are the co-chair of the Women's High Tech Caucus. And in 2014, I believe, you introduced the Women's Small Business Ownership Act. I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about kind of what you've seen uh, along the trend line as we work to get more women in tech in entrepreneurship and you know, what you think we still have left to do. Well, um, I think first it starts as we said, with education and making sure that young women have access to that, those same opportunities. But also when it comes to being an entrepreneur, I was an entrepreneur and a CEO of a startup, um, access to capital. 
Um, women just don't have the same access to capital. They, it, part of it is the networking that happens. I'm a, a, I'm a Springboard alum. There was an organization called Springboard that helped women entrepreneurs um, by helping create those networks and um, introducing them to venture capital or others who might be providing uh, or working with companies and helping them get started and helping provide um, funding. Um, that's critically important and it still is. We just, we still have um, women owned businesses and uh, who, the, and women run businesses that don't always have the same access capital. And we talk to women um, regularly who are running businesses and they talk about the challenges they have, sometimes people dismissing them or not taking meetings with them. Um, and so part of our legislation not only is making sure we have um, small, the, the in the Small Business Administration, we have focus on making sure women entrepreneurs have access to resources um, so that they can make sure that they get off to the best start and know where to, where to go and where to, to um, look for resources, but also to help create those networks because those networks are critically important to long-term success. Um, I have a couple of quick questions that I was going to do a little lightning round on some specific kind of tech policy issues, but I have one other question first. One thing I neglected to talk about is how you are a startup founder, how you worked at Microsoft, how you really come from the tech industry before you came to Capitol Hill. Um, and as someone who has worked very hard on tech policy for a long time, that's quite refreshing, and we're very lucky to have you for starters. But what I, I've always believed that over time we will see more people like you in Congress, more people who come from a similar background. And I was hoping to get some quick thoughts on how that background has been helpful to you in governing, number one, and number two, what you think we, me, and other people in my position can do to incentivize more people with your background to get engaged uh, in electoral politics? Well, I think we don't always make it something that uh, entrepreneurs and technology people think of as an obvious path to go. Um, it's always hard when you're an entrepreneur or in a position where you're a decision maker to work in a legislative body where you have to work with others and you don't necessarily just get to make the decision. So culturally, it's very different and that's hard. But, uh, but the way the world works is changing and already has changed in many ways and policy is not kept up to date. And having people who can understand what's happening and the impacts that technology and innovation have had and where those might be head and where things might be heading, I think is critically important to putting policy in place that makes sense. And we have policies like um, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, you know, something that was written in 1986, which is out of date. We, People use email regularly today. I worked on email in my early days at Microsoft, and um, here we have a policy that predates, you know, back then, you know, predates even when I started working at Microsoft in 1989, when people were still using host-based communication systems, um, and yet we haven't been able to update that law just so we have a warrant standard for digital information, the same we do for a piece of paper in your file drawer. And that's pretty, that's pretty indicative of how behind we are from a policy perspective. And if we look going forward at the Internet of Things and the huge opportunities we have with big data and um, being able to sift through that information, whether it's healthcare breakthroughs or, um, or tr better traffic management, et cetera, um, we need to make sure that policy is not only up to date, but is forward looking. And having more people who have that background and understand is important. Um, Congressman Issa and I started up the Internet of Things Caucus to help provide that education on where technology is and where it's going and hopefully give lawmakers a little bit more of a foundation in technology and, and what's there today and how policy might be involved. And so that's gonna be important and hopefully some of those conversations will entice um, more people to think about running for office and being engaged, or, so or being engaged in other ways. That's right. Um, okay, I, we're running low on time. I'm gonna do a quick hit on some of these issues. Okay. You already started talking about ECPA. Are we gonna get it done? Um, I certainly hope so. Pass the House yeah. unanimously. I mean, what, what bill passes um, unanimously? <laughs> um, so it needs to happen. It, I think we can do more than the Email Privacy Act, which was the simple bill that I was just talking about. Um, I'd like to see us look at geolocation and some other things that also are important for warning standard. But that would be a very, very important first step and, um, and is painfully overdue. Yeah, I agree. Um, Privacy, in particular, when we talk about uh, Section 702 of the FISA Act set to sunset this year, 
It's set to sunset this year. Um, Chairman Goodlatte was here talking about it. Um, this will be an important issue for the Judiciary Committee to take up. I, I'm sure they will and talk about the reforms just as we spent a lot of time on the USA Freedom Act in the last Congress. So. Yep. And they talked a lot about encryption on the last panel, so we don't need to spend a lot of time. But you were a key member of the House Encryption Working Group. Uh, you guys put out that great report at the end of the year. Um, what do you think is next? I think there's more work to do. We outlined in the report more of the, the work and some hearings and um, that need to continue going forward. Not everything is policy, but I think one of the key pieces that we put in that report is that um, you can't have back doors and expect that those can't be um, abused in some way. And I think that was a very, very, and again, this is a bipartisan report. I think that was a critical piece of that report. Um, we just have a couple more minutes. Something in that report I specifically wanted to highlight. Uh, you guys wrote, Congress should foster cooperation between the law enforcement community and technology companies. Uh, they also touched on that in the last panel. Um, how? There, well, I think, one, there are always going to be issues that come up. Um, you know, there are, we had the, the case with the iPhone, um, more recently conversations around an Amazon Echo, and, um, and there's always gonna be new technologies and requests for information. And, um, and so I think, one, if, if folks are talking to each other, maybe they can see, hey, here's something that might come up. We can be proactive and have a conversation about how things should work or where the challenges are and maybe start figuring out what we can do to address them. The, they are not easy answers to these questions, but I think conversation is critically important to make sure we're heading in the right direction, and, um, and that would be important to be as proactive as possible. I totally agree about conversation being so important, and one thing I would say about that is when I tend to work with a lot of the tech companies, particularly smaller ones, I don't think they often understand uh, the difficulties that, that you as, um, lawmakers and as regulators face. And I think that increased communication helps on both sides of that equation. Um, we're out of time. One last thing. Is there, am I, am I missing anything? It, when you go through the quick hit, the things that you think are going to be impacting technology, the well, internet. Well, there are, there are yeah, I'd say actually, you know, if you reverse it and you say technology really impacts everything, it's part of our infrastructure and we need to start talking about it as infrastructure, um, then what do we need to do to make sure we're making the appropriate investments to, to make sure we have kind of that technology foundation? What, are, what does that mean in terms of security, in terms of privacy, um, in terms of consumer awareness? And when we talk about the Internet of Things and all the devices people have, sometimes people buy a device because it looks cool, but they don't necessarily think about what happens to the information that that device is generating. And how do you have a sense of whether something, information's being protected, um, is being handled well? Um, I know there's been efforts to grade uh, kind of how different organizations are doing with respect to privacy. There's a difference between leaving and security. Um, there's a difference between leaving your door wide open for an attack and doing everything possible. Um, and maybe still being attacked, which is always going to be kind of the ongoing challenge. This is a moving target. But um, we need to make sure that folks are very thoughtful and up to date and that consumers have also some awareness of what organizations are doing and what's happening to their information. I completely agree. Um, we are so lucky to have you today, but also more broadly because it's clear that you really understand these issues uh, in a way that is incredibly helpful for those of us who are doing the advocacy around them, so thank you. Um, thank you all.